evolute of a space curve? Well, the evolute of a plane curve can be defined in one of two ways, either as the locus of the centers of curvature or as the envelope of normal lines along the curve. And a plane curve has a single evolute. But the evolute of a space curve is defined as follows. It is a curve whose tangents are orthogonal to the given curve. Can you visualize that? So what does this mean? And what does it look like? And note that a space curve has an infinite family of evolutes, not just one. So this webinar is going to look at the evolutes of a plane curve. Then it's going to find the evolutes of a helix. It's going to show what that infinite family of evolutes looks like. Now, besides the obvious depiction of the evolutes of a space curve, there's an underlying message here. And that is the utility of maple in carrying out the calculations in the drawings that provide the aha that came at the end of these investigations that I'm going to share with you today. So let's take a look at plane curves. We need some definitions to clarify stuff. So in table one, we have evolute. Formula for it r plus rn, n is the principal normal, r is the radius of curvature, involute. So the curve from which the ev evolute comes is called the involute. And that's given by r minus st, t is a unit tangent, and s is the arc length function. Parallel curves would be r plus dn, d is a real number, and n is the principal normal. Table 2 gives a brief description of what these curves are. The evolute, as we pointed out earlier, locus of the centers of curvature, or equivalently, the envelope of the family of normals. Involute. Well, mo mentioned a moment ago, it's the curve from which the evolute came. It can be drawn by the, uh, the point at the end of a, st a string unwound tautly from the curve R. And a parallel curve is a curve which is everywhere equidistant from R. Well, we're going to have to take a look at some pictures to see what this looks like. So a plane curve would clearly have many parallel curves, but it has a unique evolute, but it has many involutes. The involutes of the evolute form a family of parallel curves, one of which is the original curve R. Let's make this clear by looking at the evolute of an ellipse. We'll begin with this picture. Green curve represents piece of an ellipse, center, radius, vector, a position vector to a point on the ellipse, circle of curvature in black. This goal vector is the principal normal scaled by the radius of curvature. So vector addition, R plus Rn, puts you at the center of curvature that's blue vector R plus Rn. The locus of that center of curvature is this curve called the evolute. Now this animation will show the locus of the centers of curvature. Okay. The slider represents the angle theta or P of uh, the representation of the ellipse.
ellipses in red, the point of contact with the circle of curvature on the ellipse is that blue dot. The gold dot is the center of curvature. It traces out that black curve, and that black curve is the evolute for this ellipse. Something to take a look at, run it through several times, get a sense of how the circle of curvature moves and its center of curvature tracing out the evolute. Now we want to see that evolute as the envelope of the family of normals. Again, this is an animation. Move this slider, and you see this green line, which is normal to the ellipse. And I'm looking just in this fourth quadrant down here. Red curve is the ellipse, black curve is the evolute. Envelope is a curve, each member of which, each point of which, uh, has a tangent in that family. So those green lines are all tangent at a point of that black curve. The envelope of this family of green normal lines is the evolute. It is easier to visualize the evolute as the locus of the centers of curvature in the plane curve case, it's equivalent to this notion of the envelope of the family of normals. And I'm going to take away a key ingredient here. These tangents to the evolute are orthogonal to the red curve, to the involute of the evolute. All right, and that's a key observation. And that's the, uh, what is generalized to space curves. Let's do some of the calculations involved in finding these curves. First of all, locus of centers of curvature. I'm going to work in the student vector calculus package, and I like to have uh, vectors show as column vectors, not as sums across basis vectors. So here's R. I get its principal normal using the tools of Mabel in the radius of curvature. And I draw a graph using the space curve command. Space curve command takes a vector. I put together this graph of the evolute, r plus rn. P2 is the ellipse. And so here's a graph of these two curves together calculation of r plus rn, and I hit it with a simplify, is this vector, which gives the parametric representation. x of t is this first component, y of t is the second component. And what I want to show is that when I do it in envelope of the normals, I get the same expression, same vector. Okay, so now let's do the equivalent type calculation for the evolute as an envelope of the normals. UV is a point on the ellipse. XY will be the coordinates of a point along the normal that we're going to construct at UV. So the ellipse U of T, 2 cos T, V of T, sine T, and I make these functions, and I've done that using the uh, context panel assign S function. I need the slope of a line defined parametrically, v prime over u prime. Point slope 
form of a straight line y bring everything over minus here is the reciprocal negative so I'm getting here the negative reciprocal that's going to give me the normal line x minus the x coordinate on the ellipse u minus bring it over v to get an envelope you solve simultaneously this function equal to zero and is derivative with respect to the parameter t equal to zero you solve that for x and y and you notice that you get the same curve or the same vector parametric representation of a curve that we had here so this representation of the envelope is equivalent and here's a way of drawing the animation using um, what appropriate plot command so two definitions in the uh, plane case uh, plane curve case are equivalent it's useful to take a look at the involute and we're looking at the involute of an ellipse okay so figure one down here red curve is the ellipse this spirally looking thing is an involute and it's described as the curve traced by the end of a string unwound tautly from the ellipse so here is the string it's fastened over here at point F point P is where you would put the pencil and you unwind the string keeping it taut so here's an animation that shows what happens okay in green you see the unwound portion of the string it's it's tangential because it's being pulled taut it's tracing out this involute right here and the amount of string that you see in the straight line came from the ellipse so the arc length on the ellipse portion in green equals the length of the string that's pulled out so let's look a little bit further at this animation and you'll see the spiral being generated one more time to help understand this notion of tangency and orthogonality so down here in figure four we take a look at why is the involute r minus st where s is arc length t is a tangent vector so here is the ellipse black is the string green is the piece of string pulled off tautly center position vector tangent vector now the tangent vector points in the direction you see because the curve and the ellipse is traced counterclockwise s is this amount of string to get to point p you have to put a minus sign to flip the direction of t point out this way towards point P and s is the amount of string and T is a unit tangent vector so that's what gets you to point P that's why R minus ST works now to calculate the quantities you see here in figure 4 we'll go here and make use of maple tangent vector t that's the tangent vector we're going to compute an arc length so we need the arc length element which is really just the norm of r prime there's the norm of r prime so that's the arc length element ds except it doesn't have differentials at the end i want to integrate that that's what the int command is doing and i'm integrating it from 0 to a 
because Maple doesn't know if A is positive, negative, or is zero, I ask for all cases, and then I simplify that and just look for the case where A is greater than zero, and then I switch A back to T, so I get Arcland as a function of T, and I want to look at it. So I'm going to look at it on the integral 0 to pi. That's what I do here. And you see it's got elliptic functions because you get elliptic integrals when you do Arcland on an ellipse. And if you look at it pi to 2 pi, it's a different expression here because this is the floor function and Maple is counting how many times you've gone past pi and so forth. If you draw a graph of the Arcland function, you see it's positive, monotone increasing. And if you use that to draw the R minus ST, you get that spirally looking involute. Also, if you add something to the arc length initially, and I've chosen three values, minus one, zero, one. So the zero is the red one. And you get these parallel curves, or parallel involutes. So we really want to be looking at space curves. This all was background for our look at space curves. So the evolute of the space curve, we'll call that space curve little r. That evolute will be a curve we will call big R. And that big R is defined by the property its tangents are orthogonal to R. Little r is called the involute. Big R is called the evolute. And remember, for a plane curve, there's one involute, evolute and an infinite number of involute. For the space curve, there are an infinite number of evolutes as well as an infinite number of involutes. So there is a, uh, a difference. The evolute of a space curve is not the locus of anything. It is not the, the locus of the center of curvature, and it is not the locus of the center of spherical curvature. So we make a key observation here. This red curve is a helix. But what I have here is uh, a triple orthogonal vectors, the frenet serre vectors, tangent, principal normal, binormal. Now remember, the Evolute is a curve whose tangent vectors are orthogonal to the base curve. So the tangent vectors, this curve that we've got to come up with, are perpendicular to this black vector. So any vector that's perpendicular to this black vector lies in the plane of the normal and binormal. We'll call that the normal plane. Okay, so here you have a statement. Vectors that are orthogonal to the curve R, and this is the curve R we're going to use, it's a helix, must lie in the normal plane. And I'm defining the normal plane to be a plane that spanned by the principal normal and the binormal. So now we're going to look at a derivation. based on the definition and this key observation. So we need the notation that we're going to use. Let's clarify that. So R is the given curve, and it turns out to be the involute of the evolute big R that we're looking for. I'll use an over dot for derivative with respect to arc length. It just types up nicely. TNB Tangent, principal, normal, binormal, the Frenet serre vectors along R, along the given curve R. So you've got the given curve, so you can compute those vectors. Rho is its radius of curvature. 
Kappa is its reciprocal. It is the curvature. Tau or tau, I don't know how you want to pronounce that. It's a Greek letter, and I don't know how to pronounce those letters properly. Uh, tau. Torsion. The evolute is r plus a vector, right? r plus a vector that lies in this normal plane. So we don't know what the uh, components of the basis vectors of the normal plane, which are n and b, we don't know what u and v are. We have to calculate them. So the evolute of r will be determined once we know these two coefficients u and v. So I think we're ready to tackle this derivation. Here are the ingredients. Let's begin the derivation. You notice there are two columns here. At the top of each column, I have two of the Frenet formulas. N dot is tau b minus kappa t. Consequently, b dot is the negative of ta n, torsion times n. Now look over here. These also are frenet Saray formulas, n dot minus ta b minus kappa t. Here it's positive, here it's negative. b dot ta n, here it's positive, here it's negative. Why is this? There are two, definition, two different definitions you'll find in the literature. Depending on how you measure the angle between uh, the binormal and the, uh, the osculating plane. Some books measure it one uh, clockwise and some measure it counterclockwise. This column on the left is the way Maple does it. When Maple computes torsion it, and, and it computes the frenet Saray formulas, it's using this definition. And the reason why I've put this over here on the right column is because I've used different books to research this stuff. And some used one convention and some used the other convention. And it was very confusing to me until I realized why there are two different conventions. Why there are these two different derivations that end up looking different. So I'm going to uh, point out where the differences are. And uh, hopefully I'll stick to the maple side of the, of the table because maple calculations are going to be used. We need tangents to the evolute. And remember what the evolute looks like. It's r plus some vector in the normal plane. So we differentiate with respect to arc length. You're going to get r dot. This is a product. u dot n, u n dot. This is a product. v dot b, v b dot. It will be the same no matter what convention you're using over here. But when you replace n dot with its equivalent, and when you replace b dot with its equivalent, what's on the left will be different from what's on the right. You can see ta b, and here you see minus ta b. Here you see minus ta n, and here you see ta n. So there's going to be now differences between the left and right columns. So we factor st stuff up. We get everything that multiplies t, because r dot is Tan unit tangent vector t. So there's uh, one of them here and there's u kappa t minus over here. You get the same stuff in this column. Factor up the things that multiply n. Well, you get a u dot here and minus v ta here. On this side, 
what multiplies in? U dot here and V tau is positive. So here you have a minus sign, here you have a plus sign. Now factor up the stuff that multiplies B. You get a V dot here. You get a U tau here. A plus sign in between. When you do it on this column, you get a minus U tau. U tau. And you get a plus uh, V dot here. Okay, so plus sign here, minus sign here. Now, R dot is a tangent to the evolute. And so by definition, it must be orthogonal to the curve R. Now, by the key observation, it has to lie in the plane of N and B. So the coefficient of T has to vanish. So 1 minus U times kappa must be 0. Solve that for U. It's 1 over kappa, but 1 over kappa is rho. So we now have to discover that U is rho. And that will be the same in either column. So we now, what's left of this R dot is N U dot minus V tau plus B V dot plus Utah, and that vector is parallel to un plus vb, which this is the general vector in that uh, normal plane. There will be a difference over here, because here you have a minus sign, here you have a plus sign, here you have a plus sign, here you have a minus sign. But the point of parallelism is the same. So if this vector must be parallel to this vector, there's got to be a proportionality conflict. I'm going to use the letter C at the moment for this component is a multiple C times U. So this component is that same multiple of V. And I'm going to do the same thing here. I'll use the letter C over here, different letter. Uh, different proportionality constant, but you're going to see that these two equations here and these two equations here are different. So divide through by u and divide through by v, you ending up with c, c equals c. So what do you got? You got u dot minus v tau over u. And down here you get v dot plus u tau, that's this, divided by v. And I want to solve this tau. Over here it's going to be different. It's going to have a plus sign here and a minus sign here. So when you solve for tau, u dot over u, that'll stay on the left. v dot over v, that'll come over as a minus. Tau, u over v, that'll be positive. This negative sign will come over, it'll be positive. v over u. Well, what's going to happen over here is the left side will be the same. But the right side, there'll be two minus signs, which you can factor out. So this factor has got plus signs. This factor has plus signs. The only difference is this minus out front. Solve that for tau. You've got this clump divided by this clump. Multiply through top and bottom by 1 over uv. Multiply by 1 over uv. Well, the u will cancel here and you get u dot v. And here you will get v dot u. And down here you'll get u squared plus v squared. And when you come over here, you're going to have u v dot minus v u dot, okay, because of the, the sign differences. And this you will recognize as the derivative of the arctangent of u over v. And over here you will recognize 
this fraction as the derivative of the arctangent of v over u. All right, this is u over v, this is v over u, and that will make a difference. We want to solve ultimately for v because we already know what u is. u is rho. So we're going to have to do an integral. We're going to have to integrate the torsion. So here is the integral of the torsion with respect to arc length. It gives you the arc tangent of u over v is the integral of the torsion with respect to arc length and an arbitrary constant. This c is not this c. I just drew a c in there. On this side, you have the arc tangent of v over u, integral of the torsion, so forth. Tangent of both sides, so you get u over v. But we know what u is. It's rho. We want to know what v is. So we're going to need a reciprocal that will put v up top, rho on the bottom. You multiply across by rho. And when you take the reciprocal of the tangent, you get the cotangent. So there's v. Rho cotangent, the integral of the torsion, plus a constant. On this side, v is already up top. So you just multiply through by rho, and v is rho tangent of the integral of the torsion. And there's the difference that you end up with. Two different books, two different ways of, of writing the result, depending on what convention you take for the Fresnay-Sure formulas. R is little r. We know that the, multipl the multiplier for, for n is rho, and the multiplier for v is rho cotangent, the integral of the torsion, plus a constant. And here it's rho tangent of that integral. So it, I'm, I'm admitting it was clearly a puzzle to me for quite a while as I'm comparing one book to the other. And one of my books had a mistake in it and it actually had an algebra error in it. And it was even much more of a challenge. Uh, I had a student, a very, very bright student years ago, who uh, told me that he learned how to uh, code program using a, a controller uh, that had a missing LED. And one of the digits didn't light up. And he had to work around the fact that one of the digits didn't light up. And uh, that was probably really good for him because it really, really helped him to, to figure stuff out. Um, and kind of had that same experience here for myself. Well, as I was learning this stuff, I definitely needed an example. I needed to see what this stuff looked like. And I picked the helix because there was helix in one of my books. And it gave me something to look back at and say, am I on the right track? Okay, so here's my helix. Little r, cos t, sine t, t. So here's my maple stuff. I do a restart. I bring in the student vector calculus package. I like my vectors to be drawn as column vectors, not sums across basis vectors. See, this is sum across basis vectors, which I find much harder to read than, than a column vector. I'm going to draw pictures, so I do plots, and I need something from the student multivariate calculus package, but these two packages have a bit of a clash, so I simply refer to, to commands in that package, student multivariate calculus package, by aliasing the long name to the capital MC. So here's R, my helix. It's radius of curvature, and I'm using Maple to do the computations. Radius of curvature is Two, the torsion is a half, and the arc length element, which is the length of the tangent, the unit tangent vector, square root of two. No, the length of the, not of the unit tangent vector, the length of r prime or r, uh, dr dt, because I'm not differentiating with respect to arc length here. So it's a square root of two. I have to integrate the torsion ds. So this square root of 2 is the ds and a constant of integration. Now, if Maple would only write this as t over the square root of 2, writing is 1 half the square root of 2 
just makes it visually harder to read. I need the unit principal normal. I'm using I'm able to do those computations. I need the unit binormal. And I convert them to free vectors because otherwise they they come back as uh, uh, rooted vectors, and then you have trouble manipulating them after that. Evolute r plus rho n plus rho cotangent of this quantity q times b. So here's what those vectors look like. Here's n. Here's b, and this is the evolute. Now notice that the ev evolute is a uh, parametrically defined curve. But it's got an arbitrary constant. So it's a one parameter family of curves. This is why you have an infinite number of evolutes. Now I want the normal plane. I want that normal plane along little r. So I'm going to use this plane command from multivariate calculus. I give it the point on the plane. Now the point on the plane is the point on R, but R is a vector. This command requires this to be a list. So I convert the vector to a list. The spanning vectors are N and B. Maple computes the plane. To get the equation of that plane, you hit it with a get representation command. And then I solve it for the letter, uh, the variable z. And I call that resulting expression big Z. And so here's the equation of the normal plane. Z equals this stuff. Sine tx minus cos ty t. Well, the whole point of computing these quantities was so that I could draw some pictures. I wanted to see what this stuff looked like. So, this first attempt of plotting this parametrically defined surface, t goes from 0 to 2 pi, uh, pick some range on c, this is the picture I got. Not very satisfying. And it brings up the expression, the devil is in the details. Okay, by making some accommodations, so restrict t 0 to 1.6, uh, let c be from 1 to 1.2, I did see a surface. I did see a piece of a surface. So I said, okay, I'm on the right track, devil is in the details, you got to get the details straight. Now, the commands for drawing these pictures are hiding behind the table cells. And I'll show you once how to how to do that because I do this a bunch of places. Um, I want uh, format table properties. This is a keyboard equivalent. If you show input and say OK, you'll see the commands back there. All right. So if anybody wants one of these. Uh, wants this worksheet uh, and I send it to you to whoever asks and you're wondering what are the commands that draw these graphs you know so the devil is in the details and we have to back up to some fundamentals here let's draw a graph the cotangent and I just needed to see what I was dealing with when I was dealing with a cotangent 0 to pi then I said, okay, t, 0 to 2 pi, c, from 0 to pi. What is that region? So I use the plots in equal command to draw that region. This is the line, c is minus t over the square root of 2. And this is the line pi units above that, pi minus t over the square root of 2. So I said, let me restrict myself to looking at things over this region because that will keep the cotangent within uh, the cotangent uh, uh, that appears in uh, the evolute between 0 and pi. 
does that make cotangent Q behave nicely? Yeah, that surface looks okay. So I will stay in this region. Okay, now I have a region over which I can draw this surface without getting all of those infinities. This is what that surface looks like. Every evolute lies in that surface, is a curve in that surface. Uh, they're not these curves. Okay, they're a curve in that surface. If I look at it this way, you see the, the circle, the helix kind of induced circle. Interesting surface. Let's put the helix in there. So it's the same surface with the helix in there, right? So there's your helix, one loop of this helix here to 2 pi. Okay, and these evolutes are in this surface someplace. The next thing I wanted to see was the normal plane. So this is a construction controlled by a slider. This is not the tangent vector. It is simply the variable t. It determines a point on the helix. t goes from 0 to 2 pi. 0 to 2 pi. As a very t, that normal plane moves along the helix. And there it is, moving up and down the helix. Now, I decided to use the normal plane when t was about 4. When I fooled around here, t is 4. I said, I'm going to set t equal to 4, and I will get the evolute corresponding to the point on the helix when t equals 4. Okay, so when t equals 4, I'm here, and there is an evolute lying in this surface someplace, and I'm going to want to next draw that evolute. So I'm finally going to see an evolute. Uh, by various experiments, I set c equal to minus 1, this green curve, is one of my evolutes. That's what it looked like. Alright, I want to add that to the graph of the surface that contains all the evolutes. Okay, notice that the green curve lies in piece that upper branch there and it lies down in this lower branch here and there's my a cutting plane, a normal plane, when t equals 4. The red guy is, the red curve is the helix. That's what the evolute, when c equals minus 1, looks like. So, let's see what tangent vectors and so forth look like. So, I've done two computations here. On the left, I want to show that tangent to this evolute that I picked out, c equals minus 1, at t equals 4, so that's where it hits the, uh, the plane, the normal plane, that that tangent vector lies in the normal plane. So, I want a tangent vector on the evolute. Now, big R is the evolute. If I take the derivative with respect to t, I get a tangent vector on the evolute. This is the tangent vector to the helix. For the tangent vector on the evolute to lie in the appropriate normal plane, these two vectors need to be orthogonal according to the definition. And so I computed them, took the dot product, I got zero. Here's a picture. This is the plane. 
This is the plane I calculated, and I put t equals 4, and that this is a piece of the helix. This is the evolute. This is tangent to the evolute. It's tangent to this bottom piece here, tangent to this piece. It lies in the appropriate plane. You look along here, you can see it lies where it's supposed to. This picture is comforting. It says things behave the way they're supposed to behave. Then I found this problem in one of my books. It said, show that the principal normal on the evolute is parallel to the tangent on the original curve. Show that the principal normal on the evolute. So here is the evolute. Get its principal normal. And the utility of maple here is just astounding, right? So yes, the principal normal, you get the principal normal on the evolute. Now, if that's supposed to be parallel to a tangent on the helix, tangent on the helix, you take the derivative of t, you got a tangent with respect to uh, r there. Parallelism, you take the cross product. If that cross product is a zero vector, you have shown parallelism. What does it look like? Let's draw a picture. Okay, this is tangent on the helix. That's the principal normal. Okay, this curve, this principal normal is pointing inwards towards. The center of curvature for this curve, I believe these two vectors appear to be parallel. Okay, this proves that they're parallel. This shows that they look parallel. So, I was finally satisfied that I had seen some of these pictures, which you don't see in any of the textbooks that, have, that are around. Uh, at least none of the ones that I have. Um, I learned <laughs> what this stuff looks like in space. It's very simple to see what it looks like in the plane on a, for a plane curve, but I had no comprehension, no image in my head that I could use to visualize what it looked like for a space curve. The definition is so abstract. You know, lies this vector's orthogonal to that tangent vector over there. It was not very comfortable. But with the aid of maple, I was able to satisfy myself that uh, this is comprehensible. And that's really the, the secondary message that's lurking behind this presentation. So, you know, I showed you what I investigated, uh, dug through this stuff, Without Maple to draw these pictures and do these computations, I'd never have done this. I would never have done this. So, in in the grant proposal at Rose Holman, they got us started in in computer algebra in the classroom. We said to NSF, uh, we want to make uh, computer algebra. And we were using Maple, the tool of first recourse. When teaching, doing, and learning this kind of mathematics.